I'm Dr. Carrie Horn, author of A Soul Aligned, How God Heals His Creations, and Heart Known Series Workbook, a practical application workbook for biblical healing. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at what the Bible has to say about whether or not Christians should be vegetarian. In Leviticus 11, there were laws that were established by God regarding animals for food. And certain animals were considered clean and others were considered unclean. But we see later in the New Testament that God fulfilled this because what he was doing was teaching the, the Jewish people to how to be a holy nation set apart by God and how to not associate with the unclean, with Gentiles. They were not to join the world. They were supposed to be a holy nation set apart by God. So God was speaking spiritual symbolism through this example of food laws. After Christ came, salvation was extended to the Gentiles. Jews were hardened in order for Gentiles to be brought in. And once this happened, it's not that the law somehow was abolished or no longer applied. The law was then fulfilled just like the laws regarding animal sacrifice were fulfilled through Christ, now this law was being fulfilled. What God desired was for us to understand how to separate the holy from the unholy, the clean from the unclean. I'm going to read from Acts 10, verse 9, beginning at verse 9. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It con contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice said to him, told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied, I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, we've come for, from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived at Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it's against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? So Peter has just said the reason why... Even though when we heard earlier in the vision, he, God just said, don't call anything impure that I have made clean. And here we see that Peter understands the, now understands the vision. He now understands that God, if God has made a Gentile clean, it doesn't matter whether you are a Jew, an ethnic Jew or an ethnic Gentile. And just as scripture says, there's neither Jew nor Gentile in Christ. And again, as scripture says, a Jew is not one who is a Jew outwardly. A Jew is one who is one inwardly through circumcision of the heart. 
So does this mean that God has abolished the concept of maintaining separation between the holy and the unholy, the clean and the unclean? Absolutely not. That symbolism is fulfilled. This is what we are supposed to understand of why he originally commanded to differentiate between clean animals and unclean animals. Now, there are counterfeit doctrines and false prophets that people have followed, including in the Seventh-day Adventist religion, for example, in which people claim that God wants us to be a vegetarian or that he continues to maintain restrictions around food. And while God wants us to be temperate in the way that we're eating, in what we are eating, that is an issue of disciplining the flesh. But there is no food that is unclean. Similarly, when we talk about food that has been sacrificed to idols, the spiritual symbolism, obviously, if you've got someone who is putting oranges in front of a Buddha statue or whatever it is that they're doing, and they are literally sacrificing food to idols, don't partake in it. But you also don't need to be freaked out that you ingested food that was sacrificed to an idol, or if you go to someone's house and they've prepared a meal, did they pray to one of their gods? Or if you go to uh, you know, an Indian restaurant, that their statues mean anything. And we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 that Paul says, now about food sacrifice to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think that they know something do not yet know as they ought to know, but whoever loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. Okay, here's what I want to say about this, because a lot of people are super freaked out about spirits and super freaked out about curses and things like this. But Paul is very clearly saying there is only one God. Just because it's called a God doesn't mean it has any power. You are not somehow going to be possessed by a spirit because you ate food that was sacrificed to idols. Nevertheless, the understanding of this is that God talks about spiritual food, doesn't he? He talks about wine. He talks about being the bread of life, living water, spiritual milk, solid foods. Okay, so what are they talking about? We see in the New Testament that it's very clear that they're not actually talking about food, that is being used as symbolism to help us to understand what we are to ingest. So food sacrificed to idols is doctrine. And we need to be careful about what doctrine we are ingesting. We only ingest the truth. We don't ingest food doctrine that has been sacrificed to Satan that is being offered up to Satan. And that is happening in the harlot and in the prostitutes that bore out of her. So is God concerned about what kind of food we're eating? Well, let's take a look. Genesis chapter nine. Then God blessed Noah and his son saying to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall on the beasts of the earth and on all the birds in the sky on every creature that moves along the ground, and on all the fish in the sea. They are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. And then he says, but you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it, and for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accountant. I will demand 
and accounting from every animal and from each human being too. I will demand an account for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. As for you, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on the earth and increase upon it. So again, these regulations were established early on in Genesis. He tells Noah, do not eat anything with its life blood in it. And then he goes on to explain the spiritual symbolism of that. In Leviticus, he establishes more laws regarding food. And then in Acts, he says, don't call anything unclean that I have made clean. And then again, in 1 Corinthians, Paul is telling us, gods are nothing. Don't be freaked out by it. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4, Paul says, again, so then about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us, there's but one God, the Father from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. Then he goes on to say, but not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they th think of it as having been sacrificed to a God. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. So if someone's conscience is weak and they believe that they are sinning, that this is a sin and they participate in it, they are defiled because they chose to do something that they believed was a sin, that they believed had been sacrificed to a God who was actually something. Verse nine, be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. So I'll even just, just because you know that gods are nothing and you have every right to eat whatever you want, don't let that be a stumbling block to the weak. Set a good example for them. Verse 10, for if someone is, someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge when you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Christ, Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. So Paul is saying, be careful about the example that you're setting for others, even though it's not a sin. If they think it's a sin, set a good example. Don't insist on exercising your right and then causing a person to fall into a behavior that their conscience believes is a sin. Isn't that interesting? That <laughs> contrary to evolutionary science that says we're all here just for ourselves, competing, survival of the fittest, that something so clear our, about our responsibility to our brothers and sisters to set an example even when something is not a sin, when you have every right to exercise your food choices that Paul is telling us or the Holy Spirit is telling us through Paul, don't do it if it's going to cause someone to sin because we're defiled by what is in our hearts. So if we believe something's a sin and we go follow someone's example that person whose example we followed is also responsible because exercising their right was more important than joining us in doing what we felt was right to God. And likewise, on the other side of that, if we're doing that and someone believes that something is a sin, we are sinning against God, we're sinning against Christ, if we lead them into that behavior. Is it the behavior? No, it's not the behavior that's the sin. It is what was in our heart because it was our selfishness was more important than that person's conscience. 
and they are sinning because of what's in their heart, because they believe that they're doing something against God and they are going ahead and doing it. So it's not the behavior because obviously eating food that is sacrificed to idols, an idol is nothing, so there's no defilement in that food. Just as Paul said, the food isn't going to make us any closer or further away from God. Now, in the Seventh-day Adventist religions and in other cults, there's a doctrine that there are foods that are clean and foods that are unclean and that we should be vegetarians. And Ellen G. White was is a false prophet who they follow and don't see an issue with adding to the scroll. I don't know why that is. But I want to read to you what Scripture says about that. 1 Timothy 4. The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Now, when Scripture is saying that they're going to abandon the faith, does this mean they're not going to be in a church? No, they could be in a church. Still means, still doesn't mean that they're in the church. Still doesn't mean that they are being taught according to the faith and the gospel and the truth. Verse 2, such teachings come, from hypoc- come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths. So here again, nourished, that's a word that we use usually with food, isn't it? But this is nourished on the truths of faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Again, spiritual symbolism to food have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe." So all food, and we were told in Genesis 9 what all food is, all animals and all plants. There's nothing that we are exempt from eating. But keep in mind what Paul said, that if you are with another believer and their conscience has not quite caught up there, set a good example. Don't cause them to partake in something that their heart has not been worked into understanding yet. If they are coming from one of these false doctrines, this is something that they've been taught and they believe that it's a sin, work with them and talk with them, share with them, tell them the truth, point these things out to them, but don't then encourage them to partake in something that God has not worked their heart into understanding yet. Give them some time. Don't force your own agenda and don't exercise your rights if that is going to create a conflict in their heart about what is right with God. On the other side of this, does this mean that we just don't say anything at all, that we don't teach them what the truth is, that we don't point out in scripture, hey, this is what scripture says? Absolutely not. What we just read in Timothy tells us that we should point these things out to the brothers and sisters. We should help them to understand what is actually in God's truth. But just as you hear certain things and I hear certain things and God convicts us and He, it takes a while for him to build us and build that truth and for us to transition into, okay, this is okay, or okay, this is wrong. I can't be doing that anymore. Let their heart catch up. Make sure that you care enough about them to ask, how do you feel about this? And if they're still reluctant, respect that. Do not participate in any way in someone engaging in a behavior that they believe to be against God.
Because again, it's not the behavior that defiles them. It is what's in their heart going against what they believe God expects. So should Christians be vegetarian? I think the key word there is should. Should they be vegetarian? No, they should not be vegetarian based on what is written in scripture. Should means that there's some sort of expectation or moral issue with what they're doing. So no, it's not an expectation that you're going to be vegetarian. You're no more close to God whether you eat meat or vegetables. You're no further away from God whether you eat meat or vegetables. Can Christians be vegetarian? Certainly. You can be vegetarian. But don't claim that God has commanded it or even prefers that way of life because that is in conflict with scripture. People who claim that you're going to be healthier if you eat in this particular way, that's not, that's in conflict with scripture as well, that you're going to be healthier if you eat vegetables over meat. Where does it say that in scripture? Because God didn't say, well, eat more vegetables than meat. He said, all of it is yours to eat. He desires that we are temperate. We need to be temperate in our behavior and we need to be disciplined in our flesh. We also need to pay attention to what feels good in our body. And of course, I'm not talking about what feels good right now. I'm saying what feels good in the long run, right? What feels good right now is based on the desires of the flesh and instant gratification, which God tells us to be disciplined there and circumcised from sinful flesh that wants to overindulge. And so in Galatians 5.16, it's written, so I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So if you want to know how to eat and what to eat, live by the spirit and he will tell you. If you are having trouble with cravings or you're having trouble indulging or any other such thing, pause, discipline your flesh and ask God, what should I eat? In all things, that's the relationship that God wants with us. The teachings of Ellen G. White and other false prophets in, in this regard, with regard to food, with regard to certain foods being better than other foods and certain diets and things like that, are in conflict with the Bible. They're in conflict with the word of God and what he has established. He did establish animal sacrifice, which was provided as food for the priests the holy men of God. So how could God possibly prefer that his holy people eat only vegetables when this is what he established for his priest to eat? And oftentimes when I've discussed this topic with other people, they cite Leviticus. But we saw in Acts that God has established symbolism through certain clean and unclean foods in order to represent the holy and the unholy Jews Gentiles, clean and unclean. And later he said not to call anything unclean, which he has made clean. So anyone who is citing the Old Testament on things like this, that is, a, that is similar to citing animal sacrifice for salvation. It's just as heretical. It's just as ridiculous. Animal sacrifices will no more save us than food defiles us. And Christ said when he was here, it's not what goes into your mouth. It's what comes out of your mouth because that comes from the heart. So I hope these scriptures have made this topic abundantly clear. If you want to know what's going to be good for your body, if you want to know what God desires of you, specifically of you, if you want God to train you on how to eat, maybe you're struggling with that, Go to his spirit and ask him, but just know that nothing you eat is unclean. Thank you so much for listening. God bless you, and I'll see you in the next video.